so delighted to be with you today. And um, um, I will be talking today about where vaccines live, and that is inside health systems. And I think uh, this will be a bit of a broadening out from the discussion of vaccine confidence to think more broadly about how health systems uh, play a critical role in building population confidence. So let's start by asking, what is it that people demand from health systems? How do people think about the value of health systems in their countries? And I would suggest to you that it's quite simple. Uh, when people think about their local clinics, their hospitals, their providers, their pharmacies, they think that uh, what is happening is that when they use services, that's the utilization, they need to experience minimum quality. And those two things together produce health. So the focus of my talk is going to be on why quality is such an essential element of health systems. But I think if you just substitute the word vaccines instead of health systems, we would all agree that the only way we're going to generate reduction in mortality from COVID is to marry utilization with high quality vaccines. So in fact, this equation I think is very apt uh, for the uh, current moment. Uh, so in 2018, along with uh, 40 colleagues from all around the world, we published a report that took a fresh look at what do we mean by a high quality health system. And specifically, we defined high quality health systems as, are, as health systems that are working for people. A high quality health system uh, optimizes health in any context by doing three things well. By consistently delivering health care that improves or maintains health, by generating value and trust among the entire population and by responding to changing population and health needs. And you can see immediately how all three of these things are extremely uh, necessary in the current COVID moment. We furthermore thought hard about how do you measure whether a health system is working for people? Um, how do we know that it's delivering the things that are valuable to people? In uh, the history of health system research and health system science, we spent a lot of time measuring things on the bottom here, what I'm calling the foundations. We've spent a lot of time saying, how many doctors do we have and how many nurses? Do we have the tools and uh, supplies? And I don't want to dismiss those things. They're extremely important, but they are back office functions for the health system. What we're arguing is that what needs to be much more upfront and much more central in measurement is what health systems do, not what they have in the cupboard. So when health systems function, they provide competent care and competent continuity of care across, across episodes. Uh, they provide a good user experience. These things together join up to create the kinds of impacts that we're looking for from the health system, including, of course, first and foremost, improved health, also including confidence in the health system, which is our focus today, and uh, economic benefits from better health. I want to now uh, judge the current health systems, particularly in lower and middle income countries, which are the majority of countries in the world, against this ambition and against this vision. What our analysis has shown is that 8.6 million people die every single year from treatable conditions. Let me emphasize again, from treatable conditions. What we did is we said, would they have died if they were treated by a good health system and found that they would not have died? Furthermore, 60% of these deaths are among people who sought health care. So the notion that people don't seek health care, maybe they are too far from clinic or perhaps they're ignorant of the value of health care is just not right. Uh, in fact, many people do seek health care and die nonetheless. When we dug deeper uh, and looked at gold standard measurements of quality, which include, for example, observations, direct observations of what providers do when people come to clinic, um, it helped to explain why we have such excess mortality from a poorly functioning health systems. What you see here on the slide is an assessment of nationally representative data on how uh, health systems perform when a sick child, for example, comes to clinic. Each of these dots is a country. And these are, uh, many of these are low income countries. Those are the darkest blue. And what we see is that on average, fewer than 50% of key clinical actions are done for a sick child who comes in. Fewer than 50% of moms, for example, exit a, a doctor visit knowing what's even wrong with her child or having any assessment um, of that uh, illness. Antenatal care, which is actually quite straightforward as a former physician, I can tell you is one of the more formulaic aspects of care 
even that is then below 60% fidelity. And so we can see these kinds of gaps between what is very well understood and has been known for 50 or more years and what actually happens to people when they come to clinic. And we further note that there are major equity uh, uh, gaps in quality. So quality distributes itself according to wealth. When we look, for example, at who gets blood pressure checked, who gets a urine and blood sample taken during pregnancy, we can see that the least poor, which are the red dots here among countries, uh, are always much better off than, than the, the poorest, which are the, the blue dots here. That's not the case for every single service. In some cases, everyone gets equally poor care, um, which is not exactly great news, but we do see this equity dimension, inequity dimension, I should say, throughout a number of services. Um, so quality is a problem today. It's a, it's a constraint to health systems being able to do their job and, and avert mortality. But I'm going to also uh, argue that quality is going to become more and more important tomorrow. And we're seeing this precisely uh, mirrored in the debates around the COVID vaccine. So for one thing, uh, we do have more and more complex health needs showing up in, in the health system. Some of the highest proportions of people with hypertension are actually in urban areas in sub-Saharan Africa, much higher than in my city of Boston, for example. Many of the health needs are becoming much, much greater and, and there are many more showing up to clinics. And these clinics in many lower and middle income countries were not designed to take care of these problems. They were designed to take care of mothers and infectious diseases. Second, because we have had many uh, wins, global uh, mortality has declined for children, which is a wonderful news. We have seen uh, huge um, uh, numbers of lives saved from HIV AIDS and malaria. These are tremendous uh, reasons for celebration. However, where this leaves us and health systems in low income countries is that mortality is lower and the next tranche of improvement is going to be harder. And so quality matters much more today than perhaps it mattered when uh, mortality uh, levels were sky high. And then let's talk about this last issue, which is again, very pertinent to, to the COVID discussion, which is the rising expectations of the entire population. And that's in every country. In every country, people have cell phones. Uh, in every country, people are on social media. They are no longer content with the uh, small rudimentary clinic in their village or in their small town. They want what they see others having. And they uh, have experiences in, in cities or cousins in cities who can tell them about what healthcare, good healthcare could look like. And certainly uh, that information is, is raising expectations. And so there is a very large gap between aspiration and reality. And I think that gap is only going to grow. And what we concluded in the commission is that when you think about health systems as a whole, and health systems include vaccination systems, those decisions are made by people inside health systems. We've seen those moving photos over the last days of healthcare workers uh, giving the vaccine to, in fact, many times other healthcare workers. We know how essential the health system is. It's at the very center of the vaccine rollout. But the health system has to be ready for that. And what we note is in many countries, Many of the efforts to improve quality, to improve service delivery are what we call micro efforts or point of care efforts, where we are working one facility at a time. We are trying to change the behavior of doctors and nurses. We have short term programs, local scale and projectized programs. And what we know from the science and, and the evaluation literature is that many of these point of care checklist based kinds of improvement strategies or short trainings do not elevate quality in the health system to close that mortality gap. What we called for in the commission are macro or structural changes that would be uh, really uh, working at the foundations of the system, different kinds of training for physicians, longer term um, uh, solutions, large scale and nationally led and not donor imposed solutions. So what sorts of ideas am I talking about in terms of structural change? We identified four uh, uh, universal actions as we called them. Um, and, and one of these is governing for quality, really rethinking how health systems are governed, knowing that when people look at healthcare, back to my first equation, the first thing they look for is, is this a quality service? Should I come? Right. And so governing the whole health system as if quality was the main thing that mattered uh, includes, for example, having greater accountability in the system uh, for population health outcomes, having much stronger management, taking feedback seriously, a number of items here. And the second is modernizing health worker education. 
to work uh, as teams, to work in a patient-centered and patient-respectful manner, uh, to, to look at uh, differential diagnoses in a different way, to be able to use technology and health information systems much better. Education in many countries for doctors and nurses has not been updated in the last 40 years. Redesigning service delivery, that is something that COVID has shown how incredibly capable we are uh, in many countries of quickly, very quickly shifting how we deliver services. Now, I, I, I am calling for a more intentional and more considered redesign of service delivery, which I think COVID has allowed us to think about. Innovation care services will need to be done in person to be truly effective. But this has given us a moment to say, how do we do things? What really belongs in primary care? What really belongs as a, a home care service? Uh, and so I think this is quite important instead of taking for granted that the clinics and ways of working uh, we've always done will, will, will uh, persist. And then last uh, and, and critical improvement opportunity is igniting demand for quality. And I want to talk a little bit more about this because, I, again, I think it's, it's very much linked to, to achieving better care and better outcomes for populations. But I've often remarked that healthcare is one of the few service sectors that really cares very little about the user. It's uh, organized at the convenience of doctors and supply side uh, bureaucrats. Um, and we really don't think very much about the hours that people spend uh, accessing healthcare, uh, really working with them to educate them about what good care looks like. Um, and, and even getting information on whether they're, they're deriving good value from, from that visit. So getting the population involved in helping design healthcare and giving feedback to healthcare is essential for improvement. I think you would uh, probably like me uh, be in the position of getting multiple feedback requests from any service that you contact, whether it's a restaurant or an airplane uh, ride um, to, to, to help improve that service. You rarely get that from your doctor. And so in addition to the swath of improvements that we propose, I want to talk a little bit about how do we measure differently? How do we measure what matters and when it matters? Because healthcare, uh, health system measurement um, has also been lagging. Um, so the first thing is that we should not be measuring inputs to the system um, uh, except for management functions. Managers do need to know those inputs. But in terms of what we convey to the population, Populations need to see function. They need to know, I, I will use the COVID vaccine example, they need to know not just how many doses a hospital received like mine here in Boston, but how many people got the, the vaccine and how did they feel after they got the vaccine? People wanna know competence, um, not how many buildings or, or, or um, refrigerators there are. Uh, Performance in normal times and in crisis times. People need to see how is their health system coping with the overload, for example, of cases. Um, how do we convey that information in an understandable way? Because it is that information that then can help determine, influence people's actions. Um, and I should note that uh, we need to uh, convey performance for conditions that are crisis conditions, as well as routine conditions and in normal and crisis times. And the last area of measurement that we think has been uh, has not been attended to and is essential is measuring people's voice and values and what is it that they want uh, to experience in the health system, how is it going, and uh, and what is their degree of confidence and endorsement. And uh, we will be hearing from Professor Larson. We've also and I'm sure we'll be hearing from others. Sure people's intent. We know that intent doesn't always translate into action, and that's a great reminder. So stated preference, but also revealed preference. How many people end up taking up the vaccine? What motivated them to do it? Those are all essential pieces of information for us to be able to plan. So I want to just shift gears to this uh, dynamic element of high quality health systems. Um, as I mentioned earlier, high quality health systems have to adapt when a crisis hits, whether that's a, a, a crisis like COVID, but it's also potentially a slower moving crisis like population aging. Um, and we did some work uh, some years ago working with colleagues in Liberia um, after the Ebola crisis there to understand the notion of resilience. And we defined high quality resilient health systems as systems that can prepare for and effectively respond to crisis while maintaining core operations uh, and reorganizing if the conditions require it. So let's just think about these three things and, and judge our own health systems uh, along these dimensions. Let's see what we find when we look um, at this. 
Um, these are some data from the, that the New York Times uh, collected about how the health system is dealing with COVID and with non-COVID health threats. Because by the way, cancer does not take a break because there's a global pandemic. Uh, and hypertension continues to uh, wreak havoc on people's coronary arteries uh, while there's a global pandemic. And so while we had reduction in traffic deaths and maybe air pollution deaths, this is all still being determined, we saw ongoing health needs that were being neglected. What these red lines, red um, bars show you is, is excess mortality across a number of countries. That includes COVID deaths, yes, but it also includes non-COVID uh, mortality that should not have happened had the health system been able to look after routine conditions uh, that were not COVID. And specifically in the United States, we had over 360,000 excess deaths in 2020, um, and a quarter of those were not from COVID, they were from other causes. And so to us, this is a very clear exemplification of a health system that has failed people, uh, not to mention, of course, failed people with COVID, which to some degree, this is an expression of, of errors in the health system and, 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 and governance failures, which we can certainly talk a lot about. Uh, but it is a novel uh, disease that took us a while to learn how to treat. But also the fact that throughout this crisis, we have been, uh, we have been neglecting uh, conditions that are not COVID, that are also deadly. And we've seen data on this from all over the world, people with uh, heart attacks and strokes who are not coming to clinic. Um, and we've heard from, from Dr. Menning uh, that the, the toll may be much higher because of the missed immunization opportunities that don't show up in these data yet. These are people who are acutely ill, but those children may get infected later on. And so we will have a long tail of excess mortality showing us that the health system was not in fact resilient. And just to show you in the US, the deaths to this point, and we're not through COVID, we're in a, in a, a, a new wave right now of COVID cases here in, in the Massachusetts and throughout our country. But so far you can see that people are dying from diabetes and Alzheimer's and high blood pressure and pneumonia in large numbers. And so that's an important thing to measure. Excess mortality is an ass assessment of health systems ability to cope with conditions uh, across the board. Another thing that's critical to measure moving to the user voice is what people think about their health system. How um, confident are they that it's working? One of the commonly asked questions uh, on this front is to ask, do you believe your health system works well and maybe only minor tweaks are needed? Everybody wants to tweak the health system, improve the health system, because it's so important to us and people give a lot of thought to this. And I just wanna show you um, that uh, how, how these uh, opinions are distributed according to um, income per capita here on the x-axis and the percent of people who agree that their health system is pretty good. And I wanna just uh, um, point out a few things here that USA for its extremely high spending has actually a pretty low endorsement rate. We think of this as endorsement. And so maybe it's not so surprising that a number, a proportion of people in the United States um, are skeptical about receiving a vaccine from such a health system that they don't think is working well. Um, but I think this is an important complement to the information on vaccine hesitancy to understand whether people's uh, belief in the system that is delivering the vaccine is really there. This is one of my very favorite measures in health systems research. If you or your child is very sick tomorrow, can you get the health care you need? I'm showing you our data from Liberia. More than half the people in 2008, long before Ebola, felt that if something bad were to happen tomorrow, the health system is there to save me. Fewer than half the population. Now, this, a similar uh, question asked in a high income country would elicit usually 75 or 85 percent of the population saying, you know what, if worse comes to worse, I can find some, some care. But health systems cannot generate support for themselves if half the population thinks it can't get the health care you need. I want to emphasize here that people don't see vaccines in isolation. They see them as part of the function of the health system and that their perception and experience with quality of other services is going to color their perception of what the system can do for them and how much trust they can have in the new technology. And I want to also issue a note of caution which is that um, although you can see these low uh, confidence ratings, um, often we get uh, very high uh, satisfaction ratings and, and sometimes very high ratings of quality when people exit the clinic and they're asked, how did it go? How was the care? 
And we've been looking uh, quite a bit into this because as I've just pointed out uh, and shared with you, the objective care quality does not look very good at all. So why are people happy with the care? And our hypothesis, uh, which is borne out by some data, is that expectations of care uh, are really low in the lowest income countries. Now they're growing, and I said that earlier, which is important. But I, I want to give you an example of, of data that shows that expectations are still too low. And if people have low expectations, it is difficult for them to press for change. Uh, this is data from an internet survey done in 12 countries in which we describe a, a care visit uh, in which the nurse uh, does, does not uh, assess this patient's hypertension. She doesn't check his blood pressure. She doesn't ask about his symptom, but she gives him a new prescription for medication. And what you see on the right is a proportion of people from each country who thought this care was good, very good, or excellent. And it's generally half or more of the population thought this was pretty good care. I think as a physician, I would say this is pretty bad care. Uh, and what this is just pointing out is that we have a lot of work to do in educating the population about what to expect so that the right kind of pressure can be brought onto the health system um, to change. And so to come back to resilience and measuring resilience, we propose that there were a few uh, essential uh, elements of resilience um, that, uh, that, that should be measured and, and should be worked on. They include awareness, knowing where population um, health threats are arising. So all those maps we're seeing of, of COVID hospitalizations are an example of system awareness. Uh, diversity, the ability for a system to address multiple health problems. We've already talked about that and we've seen failures of diversity in, in the case that some hospitals have had to delay routine care, which has mortality consequences, morbidity consequences, and certainly confidence consequences. We know that good resilient systems can self-regulate isolating health threats. And this is certainly essential in, a, in an airborne uh, uh, disease like COVID. We know that health systems have to be integrated and coordinated. And I have to say that probably this is the area where we've seen some of the, the biggest weaknesses and the biggest deficits in health system function. And lastly, systems do need to transform operations, do need to have flexible responses. And here I would happily say that I think we have seen some of that adaptation. Not always, again, has it been positive, but we have at least seen the willingness to, to adapt and to, and to change. I wanna end by sharing with you um, as an assessment that we conducted in uh, Liberia after the Ebola epidemic along those five dimensions of resilience. Here's what we found after speaking with, with dozens and dozens of informants in the health system, having uh, focus groups with communities and policymakers around these uh, dimensions of resilience. Around awareness, what we learned is that information was extremely disorganized and misused, that actual underground uh, frontline health workers did not have the capacity to use the data on Ebola outbreaks in their area. They weren't trained in epidemiology. They didn't know how to interpret these, uh, these data that were coming to them from the Ministry of Health. In terms of integration, in the Ebola uh, epidemic in, in, um, in Liberia, there was extremely poor coordination among partners. Ministries were, were, had different information, Ministry of Transportation and Education were not working in concert. Um, the funding was, was, was quite confused. Um, and there was huge duplication of efforts. Some places got you know, multiple messaging efforts and other places did, got, had no, no resources to, to communicate or to uh, contain the disease. Um, we did see new del service delivery communities change practices or to respond to the, uh, to the epidemic. Um, and diversity is, it was, it was a major issue with people just refusing to come to the health system for any condition um, at all because they did not trust that the system could keep them safe. In fact, in Liberia, it took over a year for routine health service delivery to come back to normal um, after the Ebola crisis. Um, also, we saw that uh, uh, in, that ex in that instance, uh, the country was unable to isolate cases. We, we heard of many, and we, we, this was well documented, where uh, patients with Ebola uh, were, uh, were not identified and were, uh, went on to infect many, many others, including health workers and so on. And so I would ask you in closing, as we think about this COVID pandemic that is before us right now, um, how would we... Uh, what would the resilience report card look like for COVID? And just to back up a, a step, as I look at these in, in, um, elements, uh, my conclusion is that many of the same issues that we saw 
arising in Ebola um, are actually back with us again. The poor coordination, the duplication, uh, the disorganization, uh, the certainly the infodemic, as I thought uh, the WHO and others have usefully called it, um, are, are all here today. And so uh, to me, having studied this area for a while, I wonder what it is we have learned um, and how we can in fact uh, um, improve our, our response to the next, next crisis um, that, that is probably uh, not in the too far off future. Uh, I, I think we have to talk less about resilience and do more. Um, otherwise, I think we'll be in much the same place. I don't want to say it's all bad. I think we've had tremendous innovation, tremendous um, adaptation, and I think this uh, uh, the vaccine uh, development in the in a, in a record time is evidence of the ability for humans to uh, coordinate and integrate their efforts. Uh, so it's certainly not all bad, but I, I am struck by how similar some of the deficits have been and how we have failed to learn from, from the learning of the past. Um, so let me, let me pause here and happy to take any questions uh, on, on any of this.